During the 13th century, Genghis Khan and the Mongols adopted a method of conquest that led to the rapid conquest of the Middle East. The Mongols would invade a neighboring area, devastate a large region, and recede back into the empire, retaining only a small portion of the land they invaded. In this new borderland, the Mongols would establish a force called Etemma, which used the region to control Mongol frontiers, as well as intimidate and raid neighboring powers. It was the strategy that Beidou Noyan and other prominent Mongol commanders used in the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. The modern word for this method is tsunami strategy. A perfect example of the tsunami strategy is the declining Seljuks. The Mongols viewed them as a theater of operation rather than undirected conquest. That is why, after the Battle of Kuzadakh, when the whole of Anatolia played open for easy conquests, the Mongols refrained from conquering, primarily because it did not fit into the tsunami strategy at the time. The method of the Mongol conquest in the Middle East consisted of various orderly steps. First came the gathering of intelligence. Before embarking on an invasion, the Mongols would always make sure to collect information from earlier raids, diplomatic missions, and reports from merchants and travelers. The next step was to plan the campaign based on the intelligence they collected. This was very crucial, as Mongol military commanders operated on a very rigid time schedule, and all operations were enacted within it. Though independent military commanders made their own decisions, they were still obliged to act according to the master schedule. Thus, armies hundreds of miles apart could still assemble and meet with other strongholds. These meeting points would be declared in a congress when the armies were called up. After planning was the invasion of the Mongols. The Mongols would first unite all the garrisons and strike all together at a single point. Then, the armies would divide and create havoc in a wide front, eventually intersecting upon a pre-designated region. When converging, it would seem like the Mongols were retreating, though, in reality, they would unite at the frontier. By striking in many columns, opponents would be prevented from unifying, as each local ruler needed his own forces to protect his locality. Therefore, the Mongols would outnumber and devastate the surrounding regions, while the locals would remain on the defensive. The whole plan was to destroy the offensive and defensive capabilities of their enemies, not to make the land uninhabitable. The method confused the defenders. Often, when the defenders thought they were under attack, the Mongols would suddenly draw back, the reason being they did not wish to conquer all the areas they invaded, rather they'd get a stronghold of their stabilized and conquered areas. This was how the Mongols slowly and steadily grew their empires. After taking control of a small territory, the Mongols would then move on to the neighboring land, which they had already severely weakened. This method would make it appear as if the Mongols had conquered the entirety of regions in one go, whereas in reality, they had already undermined and weakened the defense of the next area. A key tool the Mongols used in achieving their success in the tsunami strategy was mobility. Even if the Mongol forces were divided, they could not be destroyed entirely, as in terms of mobility, the Mongols were unmatched and the individual columns were strong enough to defend themselves. And so, unless they were ambushed, the Mongols could always retreat more quickly than their foes could advance. And due to their sophisticated screen of scouts and signaling techniques, the Mongols were rarely surprised. Another key factor in the Mongols' method of conquest in the Middle East was the advantage of columns. Had the Mongols stayed in a single column for an entire campaign, they would have ran the risk of being tied down by a united force. The primary example and one of the only exceptions of this ever happening is the Battle of Ain Jalut in 1260, where the Memluks used a feign retreat and devastated the entire Mongol army. Rarely ever did such an occasion occur, as normally, the Mongols would exhaust their enemies with their constant dispatch of fresh columns. Exhausting their opponents physically was also a part of the Mongol tactic. The first area they would attack was typically the most heavily fortified and important stronghold. Refugees, who were not enlisted or slaughtered, fled to these points, creating a strain on food supplies, and most importantly, water. Furthermore, most refugees were not soldiers or even capable of assisting in the city's defense due to their weakened condition. Therefore, the Mongols attacking this stronghold first would not only exhaust their enemies materially, but also psychologically. Then came the transition from military to civilian rule. This transition was key to the success of the tsunami strategy. Ever since Genghis Khan's campaign in China, Mongols had started ruling their borderlands with forces called the Temma. These forces were military in nature and placed on the newly conquered borderlands. If possible, the Temma would even be used for expanding the empire into bordering territories. These troops that would expand the borderlands would be referred to as Temmachi. The main difference between the Mongol and Temmichi armies was that the Mongol armies solely comprised of Mongols, while the Temmichi armies consisted of various tribes and nations. Though, it is important to note that not all Temmichi armies were equal in skill and ability. For example, 
and the Battle of Ein Jalut, one of the Temichi armies, which consisted of Yigurs, Karluks, and Turks fought poorly, as the Yigurs were reportedly poor warriors and fought mainly as an infantry. Anyhow, the importance of the Temma was significant, as the Mongols did not use castles or fortresses as a means of protection. Rather, they raised them and viewed them with disdain. It was the Temmichi forces that not only intimidated the neighboring realms, but also served as a mighty fortress, which no enemy could pierce through. However, what made the Temmichi rule easier was the advance force, which would wreak havoc in the neighboring lands. And this was what allowed for the tsunami form of conquest. While an advance force created the political vacuum in the neighboring region, the Temmichi ruled the core of the recently conquered area. Once the Mongols invaded the lands ahead of them, the territories behind them would prepare for civilian rule. This was when the Durugachi, who were foreign Mongol governors, would replace the Temma. In order to maintain control, the Durugachi were given a force of troops, and so there was no longer the need for a regular military unit. When there were rebellions, main armies were not needed, and Mongol rule would continue to advance, as the empire expanded at a rate that it could very well maintain. This transition from military to civilian rule affected the empire in two ways. Firstly, it prevented the generals from becoming too firmly entrenched in one area. Secondly, it allowed the conquest to move forward. The Mongols implemented this strategy in all instances. During the reign of Mang Han, the Mongols obtained the capability to effectively mobilize greater amounts of resources, both financial and military, so their strategies changed. The Mongols now had the ability to effectively carry out a sustained invasion. At this point, the tsunami strategy was no longer needed the same way it was in the prior decades. However, the Temma institution remained a primary factor in controlling territory as proven in Rum with Beijunoyan, in Delhi with Yurungade, and Qitbuqa and Baydar's positions in Syria and Palestine.